Now let's integrate. The area. We've learned the rate of change of displacement is defined as the velocity of an object. If we consider the graph below, we have this rectangle where our velocity is 3 meters per second between times 1 second and 5 seconds. So the area is 12 meters. This works really nicely if the function is linear. But what if it's not? How do we determine how far something travels when the function is a curve? Consider the velocity versus time graph below, where we, now we have exponential increase. The distance traveled during the time interval between t1 and t2 equals the shaded area under the curve. As the function varies continuously, determining this area is not as easy as the example before. But if we consider an arbitrary time, so we take just this tiny little sliver of time from this graph, and we look at that velocity. So now we have this tiny sliver in the change of time, which we're going to call any tiny sliver of anything dt, or dv, or dx, depending on what the tiny sliver is representing. In this case, because it's a tiny sliver of, of time, we're going to call it dt. So this rectangle is now super small, and it's only visible for the purpose of an explanation. The idea is that the area under the curve is the sum of all of these tiny little slivers. So if we took uh, that deli slicer again and we sliced it up into infinitesimally small slivers, and we add up all of those slivers, then that's going to give us our actual area, which is a lot more, a lot easier to handle in theory, but counting an infinitesimally small thing is not very great, right? Now there is the problem of if we try to take the area of this rectangle here, there's a small gap there and we've got to account for that. Well, if we take the rectangle and we extend it above the line, then we have this area that's above the line, which doesn't count as being part of the area under the line. But that's triangle one, that's going to equal triangle two. So we're good. Okay, so we can just take the area of a whole bunch of these rectangles and add them all up. The temptation is to use the conventional summation sign, capital sigma. The problem is you can only use the summation sign to denote the summing of discrete quantities and not for something that is continuously changing. So we can't use it. When a continuous function is summed, a different sign is used. It's called an integral. And the symbol looks like this big, long, stretched out squiggly S. When you're dealing with a situation where you have to integrate, we realize, integrate, realize, we are given the derivative already, but we want the original function. So what are we basically doing? We're going backwards, or we're finding the antiderivative. So we're given the answer, and we need to figure out what was that original function. That's what we're doing. An object is moving at velocity with respect to time according to the equation v sub t equals 2t. What is the displacement function? Hint, what was the original function before the derivative was taken? So if we look at the function here, we have x uh, as a function of t equals the integral of velocity, right? Because we're going backwards. If we think about it as position, velocity, and acceleration, and to get from position to velocity, we have to take the derivative. To get from velocity to acceleration, we have to take the derivative. Well, then to go backwards, to go back up, we have to get the area, right? Well, the other name for area for us is going to be integral. So we have to integrate acceleration with respect to time to get velocity, and we have to integrate velocity with respect to time to get position. So plugging in our uh, velocity as 2t, 2t dt, this dt here just tells us that variable, the t, is what we are adding up. That's what we're integrating with respect to. And when we do that, we get t squared. Well, how in the world did we do that? All right, so when we take an integral, step one, we need to add one to the exponent the exponent that matters. So we're, this tells us what matters, dt tells us what matters, so we're going to look at t. Okay. So when I add 1 to the exponent, I'm going to add 1. 
what is the exponent here already before I even do anything to it? That's right, it's to the first power. So now, by adding 1, I have changed the exponent to t squared. Step 1, add 1 to the exponent. Step 2, divide by new exponent. So the new exponent became t squared. Remember, our, the original function was 2t, and we added 1 to the exponent up here. Now I'm going to divide by the new exponent, and look what happens. The 2 goes away, and what we're left with is t squared. That's great, and that's very interesting. It's not that useful. The useful part will be step 3, plugging in your... Oops, hit the wrong button. Plugging in your range of values. So what that means is are we integrating this function here from 0 to 10 seconds? Are we integrating it from 1 to 2 seconds? Are we integrating from 5 to 7 seconds? What is the time period that we really care about here? So part B says how far did it travel from 2 to 7 seconds? So we're setting our boundaries of this integral. The lower boundary is going to be our starting, and the upper boundary is going to be our ending. So we just put those right next to that long, curvy, squiggly looking S, and then V dt. So once we take that integral, then we get t squared. Oftentimes in textbooks, you'll see a straight line here that says now we're going to integrate. Uh, I might have drawn that in the wrong spot. Now we're going to integrate t squared with these boundary conditions. And when we do that, we're going, we have to deal with two different numbers. And that's okay because we're going to keep it very familiar for you. We're going to do final minus initial. All right, so our final is the upper boundary, so 7, 7 squared, minus the initial, which is 2 squared, 49 minus 4 gives us 45. You might have noticed the above example, we had, to chain, we had to find the change over the integral to find the area. This is why we subtract it. This might sound a bit confusing, but integration does mean sum. So what we're doing is finding the total area from 0 to 7, and then the total area from 0 to 2, and we can subtract the two numbers to get just the area from 2 to 7. In summary, basically derivatives are to find slopes and integrals are to find areas. When do I use limits? We use limits uh, whenever we care about a certain time period. We'll also use it if we care about a certain shape, as we'll see soon. So with this shape, starting from 0 to all the way to L if this were a rod and, and had a length of L all the way from 0 to L or all the way from 0 to half L or whatever shape you are trying to add up the tiny little pieces of. That's what we're doing. It's only going to be two things you're going to be asked to do. Derive, simply find a function which do not require limits and evaluate the function and solve using a given set of limits.